Today marks a significant chapter in my life as I stand in the comfort of my own home, surrounded by its walls that hold countless memories. Jack, with a beam of pride illuminating his face, welcomes me with open arms, his gestures mirroring his joy as he explores the spacious room with an enthusiasm that's almost infectious. We find ourselves in the heart of my family's abode, a place where my father's dreams took shape. Blessed with considerable wealth, my father poured his heart and soul into this home, transforming it into a masterpiece valued at an astonishing $100 million. This house stands as a testament to his dedication and passion, a legacy he entrusted to me before his departure from this world. Now, as I navigate through life without him, my husband asserts his claim over this cherished inheritance, suggesting that what was once solely mine should now be recognized as ours. Despite my insistence on its significance to me and me alone, he remains undeterred, armed with a smirk and unwavering confidence. Yet, I hold on to proof, evidence that underscores my rightful ownership, documents bearing my name, Sarah, as the sole heir. At 42, my life is intertwined with the digital realm, thanks to my role at an online bank. This career path wasn't chosen at random, but was influenced by the values instilled in me by my parents. With their expertise in financial management, they taught me the importance of fiscal responsibility, lessons that have stayed with me into adulthood. Growing up in affluence, they ensured that I understood the value of money, urging me to appreciate and conserve it. Despite our financial standing, my upbringing was marked by modesty. My allowance hardly surpassed those of my peers, and lavish dining was an exception, not the norm. My education was rooted in the community, attending a local public school over an exclusive private institution. Yet, rumors of our family's wealth spread, painting a picture a life filled with luxury and endless indulgences. Sarah, with your massive house and wealth, life must be a breeze, right? You must have all the latest gadgets and games. Can we come over to play? Such questions were commonplace, yet they couldn't be further from the truth. My reality was far from the opulence many imagined. Despite not having the most expensive toys or the newest game consoles, the assumption was that I lived a life of extravagance. I often found myself at the center of unwelcome attention, with peers perceiving my family's financial status as an opportunity for their gain. Sarah, you're wealthy, aren't you? Could you lend me some money? Such inquiries made me uncomfortable, highlighting a stark contrast between the perceived notion of my lifestyle and the values my parents worked hard to instill in me. In a twist of fate, I found myself in a tricky situation when I accidentally damaged Maria's gaming console. At the moment, my pockets were empty, and the timing couldn't have been worse. Around the same time, July and I had just started our journey as fifth-grade classmates. She questioned whether I had shared this dilemma with my parents, but the fear of their disappointment sealed my lips. I can't tell them, they might get upset. That's why I'm turning to you, Sarah, she confessed. The thought of saying no weighed heavily on me, fearing it might lead to an uncomfortable atmosphere at school. However, my parents' firm stance on not lending money left me with no choice but to apologize to Julie for my inability to help financially. My refusal left Julie in tears, and it wasn't long before whispers began to spread. Accusations were thrown my way, questioning my reluctance to aid a friend in need given my family's financial stability. I found myself entangled in a situation that I had no part in creating, steadfastly explaining that my hands were tied due to a lack of funds. Amidst this, Maria chimed in with a judgment that stung, suggesting that I valued money over friendship. The situation escalated as Maria and Julie wove a web of lies around me, claiming I had borrowed money without repaying and refused to cover the cost of the broken console. The school's faculty soon untangled the truth, reprimanding Maria and Julie for their actions. Unfortunately, their warnings only fueled the fire, and the rumors spread like wildfire, eventually reaching my parents. 
In response, my father took it upon himself to address the matter, leading to a meeting with the involved families. Despite receiving half-hearted apologies, I chose to keep my distance from Maria and Julie thereafter, enduring their occasional mocking glances but no direct confrontation. That evening, over dinner, my father offered a piece of advice that I would carry with me for years. With a reassuring smile, he reminded me of the importance of standing firm in my decisions, especially regarding financial matters. Sarah, always remember, it's okay to say no. You don't have to disclose whether you have money. If someone persists, just say you'll need to ask your parents, even though you know it's not permitted. This lesson on navigating financial disputes with grace and firmness became a cornerstone of my approach to friendships and financial interactions. As I moved on from elementary school and later graduated from university, I became more cautious about whom I invited into my personal space, focusing on building relationships grounded in character rather than material wealth. My career post-university was marked by a deliberate effort to steer clear of financial entanglements, dedicating my energy to my work and maintaining a private personal life. This experience taught me the value of boundaries, both in friendships and finances, shaping the person I've become today. At the age of 35, I crossed paths with Jack, who would later become my partner in life. Our meeting was orchestrated by a mutual friend, and despite Jack being the year my junior, his sincere and buoyant spirit quickly won me over. His candor was a breath of fresh air, and it wasn't long before our casual dating blossomed into a serious relationship. Two years down the line, we celebrated our union with a vibrant wedding ceremony much to the delight of my parents who warmly embraced Jack into our family. About a month into our marriage, my father, perhaps sensing the depth of our bond, proposed the idea of having Jack over at our place. Although I had full confidence in Jack, I harbored some reservations about his penchant for conversation, fearing he might inadvertently divulge sensitive family information. However, emboldened by a month of marital bliss, I decided it was time Jack knew everything about my background. Thus, I extended an invitation to him to visit my parents' home. Jack's reaction upon stepping into my family's residence was one of sheer astonishment. His awe was palpable, a clear indication that the reality of my family's situation had taken him by surprise. The visit, although warm, left Jack with an insatiable curiosity about our financial standing a topic he broached repeatedly during our journey home. My own knowledge on the specifics of our family wealth was vague, yet Jack's inquiries stirred a sense of unease within me. A few months into our marriage, I received a distressing call from my mother, informing me that my father was to be hospitalized. The news came as a shock, further compounded by the revelation of his recent health struggles, which until then had gone unnoticed by me. Reflecting on our last visit, I recalled my father's diminished appetite and frail appearance, which now filled me with regret and concern. Accompanying my mother to the hospital that Saturday, I was greeted by my father's attempt at cheerfulness, though his somber mood was unmistakable. His apology, for what he perceived as a burden to us, underscored his gentle nature. The subsequent diagnosis of advanced pancreatic cancer with its spread beyond the possibility of surgical intervention, left us in a state of disbelief and sorrow. The notion that someone as health-conscious as my father could fall victim to such a cruel fate was beyond our comprehension. In the aftermath of the diagnosis, my father's resolve was touching. He expressed a desire for our happiness, a sentiment that moved us to tears. Resolved to cherish every moment with him, I found myself restricted by hospital protocols, which limited visits to immediate family members. My father's longing for the presence of friends and the creation of joyful memories at our home was a poignant reminder of the life he wished for us. Determined to honor his wishes, I pledged to uphold the legacy of our home as a place of warmth and joy, even in his absence. 
The promise to cherish our family home became a testament to my father's enduring spirit and the deep bonds that tied us together. Driven by a desire to fulfill my father's dream, I decided to renovate our family home, a project that became my solace and focus during a challenging time. Jack, ever attentive, expressed concern over how much time I devoted to my father in his final days, oblivious to the complexities surrounding our family estate that I had kept from him. When Jack inquired about my father's health, I confided in him about the difficult journey we were facing, finding some comfort in his support despite the whirlwind of work, hospital visits, and the emotional toll it was taking on me. However, Tension surfaced when Jack's curiosity veered towards my father's finances and estate. His suggestions of involving legal advice to discuss financial matters, just in case, something happened to my mother too struck a nerve, dredging up painful memories. While my father had a trusted lawyer, Jack's insistence on being prudent about financial affairs began to create an emotional chasm between us. In the ensuing months, my father bravely fought his illness, but eventually passed away. The inheritance discussions that followed among family members led to me receiving a substantial house valued at $5.5 million. Jack's escalating interest in the inheritance, despite my attempts to keep him at bay, only intensified the strain. His excitement about moving into the big mansion and his intrusive questions about financial details took me by surprise, especially when I learned he had been informed by my cousin at the funeral, whose offhand remarks about the house being a waste, if left empty, only added to the tension. My explanations to Jack that the inheritance was not communal property seemed to fall on deaf ears, leading to an increase in hostility between us. Although he was present at my father's funeral, Jack distanced himself from the responsibilities and support needed during the subsequent memorial services and inheritance formalities. After some time, as life began to find its new normal, Jack revealed a shocking turn of events. He claimed to have changed the ownership of my family home into his name, presenting legal documents as evidence. This revelation not only breached the trust I had placed in him, but also underscored a profound misunderstanding of the boundaries and respect integral to our relationship. The complexity of navigating inheritance matters had unveiled deeper issues in our marriage, prompting a revaluation of our values, trust, and the future direction of our partnership. The revelation from Jack left me reeling, struggling to comprehend his actions. He bluntly admitted his fatigue from our relationship, suggesting we could coexist as housemates in the family home, albeit with me receiving minimal financial support. His ultimatum of divorce, if I resisted, was a jarring twist to our already strained relationship. In a mix of shock and despair, I implored him to reconsider his sudden decision and the unauthorized change in property ownership. Jack disclosed that he had sought legal counsel to facilitate the ownership transfer without my consent. The situation escalated to the point where divorce seemed the only viable resolution. Heartbroken and disoriented, I began to distance myself from the home and life I shared with Jack, attributing his betrayal to the corrupting influence of potential wealth. The following day, Jack's demand for the house keys claiming ownership of my ancestral home, pushed the situation into further turmoil. His attempts to forcefully enter the property were thwarted by the timely intervention of security personnel. I presented the authentic ownership documents to the guards, firmly establishing my rightful claim to the house and inheritance from my father. Jack, confronted with the undeniable proof of my ownership, was visibly shaken. His misunderstanding stemmed from a supposed legal advisor named Jerry, who had promised to navigate the complexities of inheritance law on his behalf. Entrusting Jerry with a significant sum of $360,000 to alter the property's registration, Jack had fallen victim to a deceitful scheme. In the midst of this confrontation, Jack's emotions surfaced as he repeatedly attempted to contact Jerry only to be met with silence. His frustration boiled over, 
denouncing Jerry as a fraudster preying on those blinded by greed. Jack then directed his bitterness towards me, criticizing my expenditure on what he deemed frivolous, questioning my understanding of inheritance registration and associated costs. Despite his attempts to salvage our marriage, suggesting we reconsider the divorce, the breach of trust and the depth of his deception were insurmountable. I requested the security guard to escort him away, closing a painful chapter of my life. In the months that followed, reflection and distance allowed me to process the events, reinforcing the importance of trust and honesty in the foundation of any relationship. The ordeal with Jack, underscored by manipulation and betrayal, served as a poignant lesson in guarding against the allure of wealth at the expense of personal integrity and love. On the solemn occasion of my father's first memorial service, held at our family temple, Jack made an unexpected appearance. Since our divorce, life had not been kind to him. Jobless, entangled in financial woes, and seemingly betrayed by those he once trusted, Jack cut a forlorn figure. His disheveled state spoke volumes of his plight, standing in stark contrast to the respectful solemnity of the day. As he attempted to express his apologies amidst tears, his actions inadvertently shifted the focus away from the memorial, causing a stir among my relatives. Despite his emotional turmoil, I found myself compelled to ask him to leave, a request that ultimately necessitated intervention by security. This incident, happening during such a poignant moment, left me with mixed feelings. Eager to move forward and distance myself from the shadows of our shared past, I decided to relocate from my parents' home, a decision that had been in the works. I settled into a new abode, severing my connections with Jack, who, despite everything, continued to visit the family property, now transformed into a thriving rental villa. My mother and I embarked on this new venture together, managing the villa that blossomed into a vibrant place of joy and respite for many. Jack, on his end, appeared to have embarked on a path of self-improvement, securing a new job, and earnestly pursuing a fresh start. The transformation of our family home into a rental villa not only honored my father's vision, but also became a haven for guests from diverse backgrounds. The villa, celebrated for its picturesque setting and expansive garden, quickly grew in popularity, hosting an array of events from intimate weddings to joyous family gatherings. Managing it alongside my mother deepened our bond and immersed us in a fulfilling journey of hospitality and service. In time, the success of the villa enabled us to enhance its offerings, introducing a swimming pool, an inviting outdoor lounge area, and a playful corner for children. Our dedication to creating a welcoming and memorable experience for our guests solidified the villa's status as a premier destination, drawing travelers in search of tranquility and unforgettable moments. This venture not only allowed us to realize my father's dream, but also provided a platform for creating cherished memories, echoing the warmth and hospitality that he always envisioned for our home. While tending to the garden of our rental villa, a sense of profound satisfaction washed over me. The transformation of our family home into a haven where guests could gather, celebrate, and forge enduring memories filled me with pride. I could almost feel my father's pride in what we had achieved with his vision. This venture had not only turned his dream into reality, but also bestowed upon us financial stability and a newfound independence. The journey here taught me invaluable lessons about trust, money, and the resilience needed to carve out my own path, distinct from the shadows of my past experiences. In this journey of self-discovery, I learned that adversity could indeed shape a more resilient and determined future. News about Jack reached me through mutual acquaintances, indicating he had managed to steer his life in a positive direction. Securing a meaningful job and learning from his previous missteps, Jack's progress was a testament to the transformative power of confronting and overcoming personal challenges. Knowing he was doing well brought a sense of peace, affirming that both of us were on our respective paths toward healing and self-improvement. 
Ultimately, my father's dream served as a catalyst for growth, not just for my mother and me, but for everyone who crossed the threshold of the rental villa. It became a sanctuary where guests could experience joy and make memories to cherish for a lifetime. The success of the villa stands as a living legacy of my father's vision, constantly reminding us of the values of resilience, determination, and the profound impact of realizing one's dreams. Through this endeavor, we've created a space that extends beyond mere accommodation. It's a source of joy, a site for celebration, and a testament to the enduring spirit of dreaming big and working hard to make those dreams come true. My husband and I are in Canary Islands on a trip that our daughter gifted us. During this joyful journey, something unexpected happened. We ran into my ex K, who is a doctor, along with the friends who stole him from me. They looked down on us and started talking badly about us. But when my husband asked, do you know who I am? Everything changed for them, and their lives took a turn for the worse. I'm Jenna, 51 years old, living with my husband, Julian. Our daughter, Maud, has become independent and is busy with her work and love life. She visits us occasionally and shares different stories, which makes us happy because she seems to be leading a fulfilling life. Maud is not Julian's child. Her real father passed away from illness when Maud was just five years old. It was a deeply sad time for us, and it took a long time to recover. However, thanks to a certain person, we were able to enjoy life again, though that same person would later betray us. Twenty years ago, my husband suddenly collapsed and was rushed to the hospital for emergency care. A few months later, he passed away. At first, I couldn't accept this reality and spent my days in deep sadness, barely able to take care of Maud. Working was out of the question. My mother, who came to help from my parents' home out of concern, suggested that I see a psychiatrist. Dr. Austin, the psychiatrist who treated me, was incredibly understanding and kind. He and his father ran the clinic together, treating many patients as a two-person team. It was always busy because of the number of people needing help, but despite everything, Dr. Austin showed concern for Maud, who had suddenly lost her dad, and suggested she attend sessions with me. I was so caught up in my own problems that I didn't realize Maud was also hurting. I blamed myself, thinking I was a failure as a mom and wondering if things would be better if I weren't around. It's easy to lose sight of everything when you suddenly lose a partner you've been with for years. Dr. Austin never dismissed my feelings. He gave me medication and also provided emotional support. He told me, please come in right away if anything happens. If it's hard to come to the clinic, please call this number. He handed me a business card with his phone number on it. At first, I thought it might be a bother to call him, but I also knew I might need it in desperate times. Once, when I was feeling so low that I considered leaving this world and leaving Maud behind, I called Dr. Austin for help. He listened to my tearful words without interrupting, offering advice and encouragement that greatly relieved me. Just as I was about to hang up, he said, if it's okay with you, I can give you my ID so you can send me messages. We started exchanging messages, and thanks to that, I gradually began to feel better. The days when I didn't think about my late husband became more frequent, and I eventually recovered enough to return to work. I sent Dr. Austin a message of gratitude, thanking him for everything. Then, to my surprise, he replied, Jenna, if it's all right with you, I'd like to be there for you in your personal life too. I was shocked. I never imagined Dr. Austin had feelings for me. He said, I understand you're a widow and heartbroken, but to be honest, I fell in love with you at first sight. I really like you and would never leave you. Would you consider being in a relationship with me? His sudden confession took me by surprise. I wasn't aware of his feelings and couldn't believe he would want to pursue a relationship with a patient. Dr. Austin is handsome and well-off, so I couldn't understand why he would be interested in a single mother like me. I shared my honest thoughts with him, but he assured me, you're the only one for me. I can't even think about other women. 
Hearing this, and considering how much he had supported Maude and me, I decided to start dating him. In hindsight, it was risky for a doctor to pursue a relationship with a patient, especially someone like me, living far from the world of luxury. But despite these concerns, we continued our relationship for about a year. I want to support Jenna and Maude for life, Austin said when he proposed. After discussing it thoroughly with Maude, we happily got engaged. Austin was very affectionate toward Maude, and they even went to the park together on weekends. One day, at the park, I met Kate again. Her mom, Sydney, and Austin were chatting the whole time. Austin was also great at getting along with the other moms, which made me trust him completely. Even though we weren't married yet, he was already involved with the mom friends, and I thanked him for that. Austin just laughed and said, that's normal. Once we're married, it's the natural thing to do. I thought Austin was truly wonderful. Then one day, in the middle of our happy life, Kate said something that caught me off guard. She told me that Austin was going to be her dad soon, just like he was going to be Maud's dad. I was stunned for a moment but brushed it off, thinking it was just a child's imagination. Austin was great with kids, and I figured Kate just liked him and was pretending so I didn't think much of it. But that night, everything changed. Austin told me, I'm sorry, but let's forget about the marriage. I was confused and immediately asked him why. He confessed, actually, I've fallen for someone else. Maud's words flashed through my mind, and I asked, don't tell me it's Sydney Kate's mom. Austin froze, his face turning pale, Seeing his reaction, I realized he had planned to break up with me without mentioning Sydney. It shocked me that he would go after a married woman, especially the mother of Maud's friend. I felt betrayed and pleaded with Austin, trying to hold back my tears. But he cut me off, shouting, Shut up! I was stunned by his sudden change. Luckily, Maud was staying at my parents' house at the time. Austin then added, Sydney is more beautiful than you and we're more physically compatible. Besides, you've been rejecting me lately because of Maud. I couldn't believe he chose Sydney for such shallow reasons. Whether Austin initiated it or Sydney did, it didn't matter they both had crossed a line. As I tried to process everything, Austin made a cruel remark, saying he was drawn to the idea of being with a grieving widow. I liked the way you looked, even though your clothes and hair were a bit shabby but it was your appearance as a widow that really attracted me. I wanted to control you. It was awful to realize that he never loved me for who I was. He continued, I kept treating you because I didn't want another doctor to take you away. It was a mistake that you recovered so well. Maybe it's thanks to my skills as a doctor. I should have made sure you kept coming to the hospital. I was shocked and couldn't understand what he was saying. As Austin continued his hurtful words, I quickly became disillusioned with him. I had had enough and said, let's break up, and you'll pay compensation for breaking off the engagement. Austin looked surprised for a moment, but seemed eager to be with Sydney. I'm a doctor, and money is no problem for me. Here, take it. With your poor appearance, you should go to a beauty salon. But since you'll be a single mother now, maybe not. And so, my relationship with the despicable Austin ended. I also demanded compensation from Sydney. She said, since you're a single mother, you'll need money. Fine, I'll donate this to you. In return, I'll take Austin without any hesitation. Bye, greedy poor person. I was never particularly close to Sydney, but I never imagined her character could be this bad. At this point, it seemed those two were a perfect match for each other. In fact, I even thought it was probably for the best that Sydney took Austin away. Later, I found out that Sydney got divorced and within three months, both she and Austin had left town. However, since Austin's father's clinic was in the area, they likely hadn't moved far away. By the way, Kate, who was excited about Austin becoming her dad, ended up under the custody of Sydney's husband. Apparently, it was too difficult for Sydney's husband to raise Kate alone, so he also moved back to his parents' home. This news made Maud burst into tears. I don't want Austin to leave, she cried. 
More than being upset about Sydney taking Austin away, I was heartbroken to see Maud cry. I had never wished for someone's misfortune before, but after everything that happened, I sincerely hoped those two would be unhappy. Now, at 51, I'm very happy. I thought I was done with men, but then I met someone by chance and remarried. He's nothing like the despicable Austin, a truly wonderful man who cares deeply for both Maud and me. His name is Julian, and he's 55 years old. Although he's usually busy with work, he frequently makes time for our family. Now that Maud is independent and it's just the two of us, we're living like newlyweds. Then one day, he handed me something and said, Here, take this and go enjoy Canary Islands. I received tickets to Canary Islands from Maud, who had gotten a bonus at work. She even booked the hotel for us. Oh no, that's too much, I said, feeling overwhelmed. It was our first overseas trip. Aren't you coming with us, Maud? I asked. It's a token of my appreciation for all you've done, so go enjoy it together, she replied. We accepted Maud's kind offer and decided to go on the trip to Canary Islands. It was our first overseas trip as a couple, and it was incredibly fun. After a long day of sightseeing, we headed back to our hotel. Suddenly, I heard a voice, Huh, is that Jenna? I turned towards the voice and, to my surprise, saw Austin and Sydney, the ones who had betrayed me at the same hotel we were staying in. Who's that? Austin asked, pointing at Julian. He's my husband, I replied. Both of them started laughing. You remarried, but your new man looks, I don't know, kind of poor, they said, suddenly insulting Julian. It's true that Julian isn't fussy about his appearance and rarely wears brand name clothes. Excuse me, but what brand is that outfit? Austin asked in a clearly condescending tone. When Julian mentioned the name of a clothing chain store, the two of them burst into laughter. What? You shop there. You're poorer than I thought. Unbelievable. Isn't that the store where only really broke people shop? They mocked a person they had just met, and I was so shocked that I couldn't speak. You seem to be struggling with money, yet you're on a trip to Canary Islands. Are you sure it's okay? Austin questioned. Julian responded calmly. Actually, it's a gift from our daughter, which we're very grateful for. Julian's smile and composure showed a mature response. Daughter? You mean Maud? She's already an adult, but it's pathetic to beg your own child for a trip to Canary Islands. If you're going to beg, ask for clothes, not a trip, they continued mocking. Exactly, Jenna, still living a poor life even after getting married. Isn't that crazy? Their rudeness was too much, and I was furious, ready to respond. But before I could say anything, Julian spoke up. Excuse me, but Jenna is not poor. While it's questionable to berate a stranger, I cannot tolerate insults toward Jenna. Julian stood up for me. Ha, huh, what are you trying to prove, poor man? Do you even know who I am? I'm a doctor, Austin boasted while laughing. Really? You're a doctor? Julian calmly asked. Yes, I am the only son of a clinic owner, and I'll be taking over as the head doctor soon. Impressive, right? Austin continued arrogantly. Doctors are rich and can choose any woman they want. You poor people are in a different league, you just look poor. I couldn't bear to listen to Austin's words anymore, and meanwhile, Sydney stood there with a nasty smirk on her face. You keep calling me poor, but do you even know who I am? Julian asked, clearly frustrated. Austin, thinking he had the upper hand, dismissed him as just some poor guy. In the short time we had been talking, Austin had used the word poor so much that it seemed like his favorite insult. It was obvious that he looked down on others. But then Julian said something that completely changed the smug attitudes of both Austin and Sydney. Actually, I think I'm quite well off, Julian began. I run a pharmaceutical company. What? Austin exclaimed, clearly shocked. Yes, Julian had inherited a major pharmaceutical company from his father. In fact, he even supplied the hospital where Austin worked. The realization hit Austin hard he finally understood who Julian was. No way. 
You're the president of the company we rely on. Seeing Austin's shocked expression, Sydney started to panic. Julian remained calm and polite, saying, Thank you for using our services with such elegance that I found myself falling for him all over again. Sydney, desperate to regain control, snapped, So what if you're a pharmaceutical company president? If the doctors decide not to use your drugs, it's over, right? Austin stopped dealing with this guy's company. But Julian wasn't phased. That's not possible, he replied. The decision is made by the head doctor and the pharmacists. It's not something I can interfere with. Austin's face turned pale as he realized the gravity of the situation. Sydney, too, went pale as the reality of what they had done sank in. Did we just make a huge mistake? She asked, and Austin could only nod in response. Julian continued, I've had a long relationship with your father. We've played golf together and shared meals. Our relationship has grown from just a business one to a friendship. Hearing this, Austin deeply bowed and apologized. I'm so sorry. I'll speak to my father, the head doctor, about this. Meanwhile, Sydney stood there in a daze, and Austin looked utterly defeated. That's not going to work, Julian said calmly. The moment you insulted Jenna, I started recording everything. He had sensed the hostility in the air and had begun recording the conversation on his phone right away. I really am sorry, Austin stammered. I shouldn't have called you poor. He was apologizing profusely now. Julian approached him, his voice firm. Jenna has told me before that her ex K was a jerk the worst kind. And now, here you are, with Maud's friend's mom, still insulting Jenna. There's a limit to how much you can disrespect someone. Julian's words hit Austin hard, leaving him speechless. Both Austin and Sydney fell completely silent, realizing the full extent of their mistake. I felt a wave of happiness as Julian stood up for me, and his courage inspired me to confront Austin and Sydney as well. Ever since they got together, I had always thought Austin was just right for Sydney cheating while having a child and insulting people without a second thought. You two are perfect for each other with your terrible characters, I said, my voice steady. So thank you, Sydney, for taking such a lousy man off my hands. The two of them probably never expected me to speak up like that. I continued, and what kind of nerve do you have insulting someone you've just met, especially on a vacation? My husband, no less, calling him poor and whatnot how old are you both? Is your mind all right? To anyone watching, you two seem like the crazy ones. At my words, I saw a hint of realization cross their faces. No, we were just drunk, Sydney stammered. And seeing you after so long, looking so happy, we just, she trailed off, trying to excuse their behavior. Such an excuse is unacceptable, I replied firmly. So being drunk excuses anything. And what does it matter if I looked happy? It's sad that you can't be happy for someone else's happiness. Julian addressed them calmly but firmly, we might never meet again, but don't ever say such terrible things again. With those parting words, we walked away, leaving them standing there, still trying to apologize. As we left, I could hear them saying, I'm really sorry, over and over. Julian, still angry, decided to send the recording he had made to Austin's father. Not long after, Austin's dad called. After Julian explained the situation, it was clear that Austin's father was furious. Having met him a few times, I knew he was a strict man, and this news would not sit well with him. I could easily imagine Austin facing the wrath of his father. After their conversation, Austin's dad called us to apologize and said he would deal with Austin. Then he hung up. For Austin and Sydney, it must have been the worst Canary Islands trip ever. If they hadn't confronted us that day, we could have been enjoying ourselves at the hotel instead. A few days later, something unexpected happened. Austin's dad, along with Austin and Sydney, showed up at our house. Sydney was wearing light makeup, and both of them had noticeably red faces, clearly embarrassed. We are truly sorry for what we did. They apologized sincerely. 
Acknowledging that they had wronged us, they offered a substantial amount of money as compensation. At first, we refused, but they insisted, so we accepted it. After that, the three of them left. Later, Austin's dad told Julian that Austin and Sydney had gotten divorced. It turned out that Austin's father had pressured them into it. He had never approved of their marriage from the start. Moreover, Austin was supposed to take over the family clinic, but that plan was now off, and he even faced a salary cut. As for Sydney, I didn't know what became of her afterward, but I recently heard a rumor that she was spotted working in a mature women's delivery service, looking quite haggard and struggling. Who could have imagined such an ending for someone who abandoned her child and stole her classmate's mom's fiancé? But I thought it was their responsibility to deal with the consequences of their actions. As for us, we felt upset after that incident, but after a good night's sleep, we felt refreshed and enjoyed the rest of our Canary Islands trip. When we told Maud about our experience, she laughed and said, That's a good example of the kind of adult not to become. Indeed, I thought, it was for the best that we had split up with Austin, especially for Maud's sake. Now, we're planning our next family vacation, eagerly looking forward to our happy trip together.